Well, good morning. We have a quick video we want to show you. It's about two and a half minutes long. Um, yeah, so just kind of pay attention. Ladies, don't elbow your husbands, all right? Just, just let it ride. It's fun, all right? Phyllis? <laughs> Poached eggs? Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm. 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 Oh. Mm. Mm. Oh, this is so good. <laughs> I can't wait to see what you guys do next week. For Mother's Day? Did any mothers get breakfast today? <laughs> I must admit, I must admit, a couple of weeks ago, I was looking at the calendar, and to my surprise, oh, it, it's, it is normally, it normally kind of falls, like, not all the way to the 14th. The 14th feels like it's over and gone, and we missed it, but we didn't miss it. So, gentlemen, seven days and counting. You have been informed. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church. Thank you so much for being here this morning with a smile on your face. Let's start singing. Go ahead and stand. Saved, saved as we start our service this morning. <clears throat> I found a friend who is all. great hymn to start with and that got you going let's keep those singing voices going my sins are blotted out i know <clears throat> Stand 
We heard choir sing this a few weeks ago, and now it's our turn. He hideth my soul and covers me there with his hand. Let's lift it up one more time. <clears throat> oh. Good to see you all. If you are here expecting it to be Mother's Day, simply turn to that mom or wife and say, oh, this was just the trial run. It'll, it'll cover it. You'll have it all taken care of. Yeah, it won't be otherwise. But, oh, that was a great video. We appreciate that. And we do appreciate our moms, okay? And so if your mom is still with you, make sure you reach out to her this week. Or if your mom is not here and you have a wife who's a mom, let them know how much they are appreciated. Well, let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, good morning. We do thank you for good, godly moms. We thank you that, uh, Lord, we can uh, just look to them and realize the impact they had on each of our lives. And I pray now that, Lord, as next week we celebrate that, what we would remember it's what you did through them in each of our lives. And, Lord, we appreciate all the moms that are here today and will be here next week. We do pray for our service today. Be with Brother Barry. Give him clarity of thought, clarity of speech. And Lord, allow us to listen with open hearts and open minds. We love you, God, in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. You may be seated. If this is your very first time with us at First Baptist Church, I hope you realize we like to have a good time. But when it gets down to the Bible preaching time, we get serious. But we do like to enjoy ourselves. We like to laugh. We like to smile because that's just important for us. And so these gentlemen are right here up front. If you have not been here before or not been here in a long time, would you get their attention? We have a card. We'd like to have a record of your attendance with us. We'll communicate with you via email. If you don't have an email, let us know that, and we'll find another way to get a hold of you. If you'll put a phone number or something. Uh, and there's good uh, instructions there because what we're going to do is in your honor of being here, we're going to give $10 to a local charity, and we'll let you pick that, okay? We're not going to give them your name or anything. We're simply going to do it in honor of you being here. 
All right, I saw some folks. I was ready to help Joe out. He was standing right next to a visitor and didn't even know it. Fantastic. Good to have you all. We're going to have a great time this morning. All right, before we get into our missionary of the morning, just like to say, praise God, we only have three weeks of school left. Amen. Who's excited about that? I know parents and teachers and everybody's excited about that. Miss Diane, are you giving us an announcement at the end of service today? All right. Okay. So let's get right into our letter. And uh, our letter today is from the Kents. Kents are serving the Lord in Atlanta, Canada, First Nations people. And this letter was just written April uh, of, this, of this year. And it goes on to say, Dear Praying Friends, a lot has transpired in the last two months. We've packed up all of our stuff and moved out from our rental in New Brunswick due to its selling. We've stored half of our belongings in New Brunswick for an apartment on our return. And the rest we drove a U-Haul for three days to store in Florida. As soon as we got to Florida, Greg was able to get his consultation for his surgery. His hip replacement surgery is scheduled for tomorrow, that is. So we'll be praying for him in a moment. Please pray for a successful surgery and a quick recovery. On our Tuesday night Bible study, had a high attendance of 25. Some of our youth uh, and their families were in attendance. One of the teen's mom who was struggling with addiction came. She didn't make a decision, but she did hear the gospel message. Praise God. So we're going to pray for her salvation as well. On Easter Sunday, we were beyond thrilled to see two of our teens from our youth group make their salvation public by being baptized. Amen? Please pray for Allison and Seth as they continue to walk with the Lord. Thank you so much for your faithful prayers and support. We are so blessed to see God work uh, on our behalf in the ministry that he has called us to. For his glory, Greg and Colleen. Let's go to the Lord and pray God's continued blessing to be upon the Kent family. Father, we thank you once again, as we usually do, for giving us the privilege to partner uh, with another missionary family. We thank you for the Kents, and we thank you that you're able to work in their life. We pray you continue to do so. We pray for surgery for uh, tomorrow, that Greg would have uh, a successful surgery for, for his uh, hip replacement, we ask you to give the doctors much wisdom, and we pray that it would all go well and that he would have a, a quick recovery. We pray that there would be the absence of infection and all would go well. We also pray for, for this uh, mom who came out who's really struggling. We pray that you grab a hold of her heart and uh, that she might come to a saving knowledge and that you would heal her from uh, that addiction, and that you would receive much honor and glory through her transformation of salvation. And then uh, we also uh, pray for, uh, or we rejoice uh, with, uh, with the Kents for these two young people who've uh, come to, uh, to uh, they got saved and also baptized. We pray that, that they would have a spark in their own lives, and that would spread throughout the youth department in the church. We pray you continue to use Greg and Colleen. We pray that your hand would be upon them, and we pray that your rich blessings would continue uh, to be bestowed upon them. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The choir is now going to sing, Wonderful, Merciful Savior.
Thank you very much, choir. Uh, just a reminder, I'd like to make this reminder every now and again, that uh, choir meets for practice at uh, 4 o'clock on Sunday evenings before the evening service, back here in the music room through the little white door over there. And uh, we are on the service on Sunday morning and Sunday evenings, uh, singing uh, a new song each week. So if you are, we just ask you to pray about it. If you're thinking about getting involved in a ministry here at First Baptist Church, and you think you might like the choir, there's always room. We'd love to have you. You can talk to myself or one of the choir members. We'd love to have you come and kick the tires a little bit and see if uh, you want to stick around and, and join up, lifting your voice up each and every Sunday morning. Well, speaking of the choir, they're going to come and find a spot in the congregation. You guys are going to have a time of fellowship. You can stand once again, shake hands, say hi to folks. We'll sing together again in just a moment.
As we come back around to the beginning, our great Savior, join in the instruments as we continue with this great hymn. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends may fail me, foes assail. singing about Christ and how he is our savior this morning and this next medley <clears throat> sings about just this that as well Jesus we just want to thank you and thank you Lord two songs that just go nicely right together as we come to our offering <clears throat> let's lift it up prayerfully Jesus we just want to thank you Jesus we just want to thank you Jesus, we just want to thank you. Jesus, we just want to thank you. Thank you for being so good. Jesus, we just want to praise you. i 
you for being here today. Let's go to the Lord and ask him to bless this offering. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for who you are, for all that you've done, for your plan for sinful man, for your plan to rescue us through the sacrifice of your son, for the gift of eternal life that he offers to us freely because both you and he loves us. We pray that we would live in such a way that we thank you for loving us. Bless this offering now, in Christ's name, amen.
things change, plans fail, and you look for love on a grander scale. Storms rise, hopes fade, and you place your bets on another day. When the going gets tough, when the ride's too rough, when you're just not sure enough, Jesus will still be there. His love will never change, sure as a steady rain, Jesus will still We are studying the life of Abraham. We are in Genesis chapter number 22. We've called it Abraham's greatest test. Two Sunday mornings ago, we began focusing on it by looking at the sacrifice command of the Lord in verse 1 and 2. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Last week, 
in verse 3 through 14. We started there. We, we began and then we continued looking at the sacrifice of Abraham. The problem for his conduct, we've already seen, it's in verse 2. He loves his son. God told him to take him and sacrifice him. The promptness in his conduct picks up in verse 3. Abraham rose up early in the morning. Preparations for his conduct continue there. Took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went into the place God told him. The performance in his conduct is in verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place of far off. Privacy, verse 5. And Abraham said to his young men, Abide ye here with the animal, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Verse 5, actually I read too far. We got the promise about his conduct, which is he's coming back, both he and Isaac. And then we continue the performance in verse 6. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac, his son. He took the fire in his hand, in a pot and a knife, and they went, both of them, together. We pick up our study this morning in verse 7. And Isaac spake unto his father and said, My father? And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound his son and laid him on the altar. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abram called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, meaning the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Heavenly Father, it's hard for us to fathom that you would even require this of the man. With the benefit of the remainder of Scripture, we know exactly why you did what you did. But Abraham did not. What tremendous faith he had in you to give him back his son if he obeyed, to protect him from the sorrow and grief of losing a son. We pray that you'd help us as we study the word today. Give us wisdom and insight. We pray that you'd use this passage of scripture to teach us to increase our faith. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We're beginning today with the perplexity about Abraham's conduct. It concerns the man's preparation and his decisions and a discussion about both of those things. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon his son, took the fire in his hand, and a knife. That's his preparation. He brought everything with him that was necessary to worship. He did everything that God had told him to do. He brought the wood, the fire, the knife. He even brought the sacrifice, Isaac. On the first part of the journey, Abraham and Isaac had servants, but on the last stage of the trip, they went alone. What is happening is that Abraham's faith is forcing him to obey the Lord, even when he did not understand the Lord's command, even when God had not bothered to explain what and why. Abraham was prepared to practice worshiping the Lord, even if it cost him great sacrifice, physical, emotional, financial. 
He was willing to do what the Lord said to do. I think there's even more here than faith. I think there's love. Abraham loved God. He believed him and he trusted him. He believed he was holy and righteous and good. And Abraham trusted his son in the hands of God. The Lord is about to use this event as a picture of what he and his only son, whom he loved, would do in this same place. Mount Moriah is the place where David purchased a threshing floor and offered sacrifice to the Lord. It is the same place where Solomon built the temple. Right next to this place is where Jesus Christ died on Calvary. The altar was a cross. The mount was Calvary. One part of that sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ was that he would carry the wood upon which he would be offered. And so Abraham, in direct symbolism, took the wood burnt or the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. This is teaching about what God and Jesus Christ did for us on Calvary. Still, the question is begged, why would Abraham do this? Why would he come this far and go to this grade of length in sacrifice and service to honor and obey God? If you're like me, if I actually believe that God said to me to do this, to take my son and offer him, I would act like I hadn't heard. I would disobey. Wouldn't be the first time I disobeyed the Lord. I don't think I could do it. Unless I believe what Abraham believed. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, 18, and 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. That's a lot of faith. I believe in the resurrection. I believe that with my children die before I die, if I die before they that we will all be raised in the resurrection and we will see each other again. But this pushes it. And so in verse 6 and verse 7, Isaac asked a question. And they went, both of them, together. And Isaac spake unto his father and said, My father? And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. Where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Isaac knew what was involved in the sacrifice of worship. He knew what was required. Fire, wood, lamb. Here's a teenager, not complaining about worship, not complaining about work. He's simply asking a question which arose from his experience and his observation. By the way, who taught Isaac about worship? Abraham. Dad, you, you've taught me what we need. There's no lamb here. Back in chapter 18 and verse 19, during the prequel to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Lord and his angels had met with Abraham and were speaking with him. And then the Lord looked to his angels and allowing Abraham to hear the conversation said this in Genesis 18, 19, and Genesis 17 through 19. Shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I'm about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. God said, I, I know this man's going to raise his son right. And now we found out he did. Isaac knew more about worship than a lot of folks today know about worship. Pretty amazing because they're pretty limited in what they knew about worship and even about God 
here in Genesis chapter 22. They understood that God had to be worshipped with a blood sacrifice. To practice worship without a blood sacrifice, to, to preach salvation without a blood sacrifice, is not to recognize the number one essential ingredient of worship and salvation. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know how many songs we sing about the blood? There is a fountain filled with blood that flows from Emmanuel's veins. Our songwriters understood this, and we understand it. I read one author who, in writing about the blood sacrifice, said this, quote, Churches are rarely without the fire of emotionalism or the wood of formality, but many like the most important ingredient in all of worship. And he closed it right there. I'll finish it. The blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Abraham's answer, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. The answer of Abraham to the question of Isaac lacked detail, did not lack faith. So why didn't he just say, hey, you're the sacrifice? There's something that Abraham seemed to understand that our culture is missing. There are some things that children don't need to know. This is a 17-year-old. His dad knows more than he knows. His dad knows exactly what God has commanded. It's not the right time to tell him. Not only was this statement an indication of great faith in God, it was a prophetic utterance in at least three important applications. First of all, God will provide. If God is going to save others, there needed to be a spotless, perfect offering I think Abraham, even though God had told him to sacrifice his son, I think Abraham understood that Isaac wasn't it. I love my sons. They're not spotlessly perfect. <laughs> They're not even close. They're a lot like their dad. Matter of fact, my sons have done some of the same dumb things dad has done. They practice my sins. I, every now and then I hear my sons I hear myself coming out my son's mouth. Not too long ago, one of my sons said, oh, this is weird. I hear dad coming out of my mouth. I said, good for you. God will provide himself. When Jesus Christ was introduced to the world by John the Baptist, he said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. God will provide himself a lamb in Christ. God himself provided the sacrifice for sin. Man did not. And since Jesus Christ is God, God himself provided himself as a lamb, as a sacrifice. What God had asked Abraham to do, not telling him why, was to picture for us what God the Father and his son, Jesus Christ, did. Remember on the cross when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Do you know why he did that? Because just as Abraham and his son went up together, both of them together, God was with Jesus Christ until he was on that cross. And when he became sin for us, God turned his face but God was with Jesus Christ all along the way. They went together. How much of all this Abraham understood, I don't know. But I do know that what the man said was incredibly profound and prophetic. I know his conduct was persuasive. In verse 6, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac his son, and both of them went together. 
In verse 9, they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And then in verse 10, Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife. What I find most fascinating part of this story is not only that Abraham complied with God's command, but that Isaac cooperated. Now, instead of placing myself in Abraham's spot, I've, in my mind, placed myself in Isaac's spot. What if Isaac was me and my dad was Abraham? Would I behave like Isaac? I don't have that much faith in myself. The closest thing to a protest from Isaac was a question asking for clarification. Hey, Dad, we got everything but the lamb. Where's the lamb? This worship was not only an act of faith on Abraham's part. Isaac was also acting upon his own faith. Faith in his father, Abraham. Faith in God. You see, the everlasting God was not worshipped only by Abraham. Isaac was also exercising faith in God, along with and apart from his father's faith. There is faith in both of these men. Twice we have read, they went both of them together. But all along the way, from the beginning of, to the end of this adventure, each went of their own free will and because of their faith in God. Abraham and Isaac chose to obey the Lord in something that went way beyond their ability to comprehend. The finite mind cannot comprehend God. We are told to trust in him, to believe in him, to have faith in him. The picture that God is painting with the actions of Abraham and Isaac is not just that of an ancient man and his obedient son, but of an almighty God and his sinless son. Offering his blood sacrifice to pay for our sins. In verse 9 through 14, we see the provision during this conduct. It begins with a stoppage in verse 9. They came to the place which God had told him of. Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order, bound Isaac his son, laid him on the altar, stretched forth his hands, took the knife to slay his son. He has complied with every command of God, and at every point in this worship experience, there was work for Abraham. I use the word worship experience on purpose because I hear it a lot. It was a wonderful worship experience. This was a work worship experience. This was a faith testing worship experience. This was a difficult worship experience. It wasn't wonderful, it wasn't pleasant, but it was worship. They walked for three days, verse 9. He worked to put the wood on Isaac. They walked again. They arrived at the place of sacrifice. He worked more. He gathered rocks. He stacked them. He made an altar. Then he stacked the wood on the altar that Isaac had carried up that mountain. Then he bound Isaac's hands, and he laid his son on the altar. When is the last time you worked at worship? It's a concept lost on our culture. We show up and everything's done for us. Plans have been made. Preparations have been made. We get to enjoy an experience of worship. If it costs us anything, it's our time to get here and our tithe if we do. I learned something years ago. You probably learned it too. The more I put into something, the more I get out of it. And it seems to work in every area of life. The more I put in, the more, the more I involve, the more I enjoy it. It just, it just works that way all the time. There is a completion. At the moment, Abraham reached for the knife. God spoke. Most artist renditions picture this event with Abraham and the knife in his hand, and the knife is hard, high above his head, and he's ready to plunge it into the heart of his son. That's not the way sacrifices work. They slit their throat and let them bleed. I don't believe Abraham even had to get the knife near his son's throat. I think he's reaching for the knife, and as he reached for the knife, God said, Abraham, don't you hurt him. 
There's a correction and a compliment. Lay not thy hand on the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. Here's a compliment. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast with not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. I believe this is the first time that God has offered an explanation of any kind during this trial for Abraham. Abraham, the friend of God, a man of extreme faith in God, has passed the test. He's resisted the temptation from within to rebel against the word of the Lord. Now here's something else I find interesting. Why didn't Abraham say, God, you're omniscient, you know everything? I don't think Abraham knew it yet. We know that God is omniscient, he knows all things. What Abraham knew about God is that he's everlasting. Because the Lord's covenant to Abraham was called everlasting several times. Genesis 18, Genesis 17, sorry. Genesis 17, 7, 8, 13, 19. An everlasting covenant given by an everlasting God. In order for the promise of God to be everlasting, the Lord God had to be everlasting. Do you ever buy something and get a lifetime guarantee? Do you understand what a lifetime guarantee means? That's not your lifetime. That's the lifetime of the business who's making the guarantee. And if you buy something with a lifetime guarantee and next month they go out of business, your guarantee just went out of business. A lifetime guarantee lasts only as long as the one who's giving the guarantee. We have an everlasting God who gives us an everlasting promise of everlasting life and it's guaranteed upon him he's the everlasting God that's how much Abraham knows about God so when God says to Abraham now I know how much you love me actually God knew all along how much Abraham loved him it's another example of letting a teenager even a man know as much as they need to know and not giving them more. Immediately after the Lord ordered the stoppage, he offered a substitute. Verse 13, Abraham lifts up his eyes, looks behind him. There's a ram caught in a thicket by his thorns. Abraham went and took the ram, offered him up for a bird offering in the stead of his son. Got a question for you. How long had that ram been there? Oh, it just got caught. Ah, it could have been there for hours, and Abraham would not have seen it. You know Why? Because when you are overwhelmed with grief, you only see right here. He's doing what God told him to do. I cannot imagine the man not weeping over all of this. Even in faith, just the thought of losing a son puts tears in my eyes. A ram caught by its horns would not be wounded by those thorns So the ram is not wounded. It is an offering worthy to be offered to God because to to offer an an animal to God, it had to be without spot. If it was not without spot, the type and picture of the sacrifice of God's sinless son would be destroyed. So we're told, it's not just caught in, it's caught by the horns. The ram was near just behind him. And the Lord is always near. He is closer than we realize, maybe closer than what we are comfortable with. Choir's gonna sing either tonight or next week, I'm not certain. A song called He's As Close as the Mention of His Name. And the idea of the song is, is the Lord is right next to you. The ram was free, provided by God at no cost to Abraham. It was not from his herd. And the picture of salvation is strong here. We are to worship, but without the Lord, without the blood sacrifice being supplied by God, our worship will not be accepted. It cannot be acceptable. Romans chapter 3, verse 22, 24, the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all that believe. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You're either saved by the blood of Jesus Christ or you're not saved. There is no plan B. There is no option The ram was appropriated. Abraham had to take that which God had provided. God offered. Now Abraham's got to do something. 
The same is true in salvation. God offers salvation through the gift of his son, and we must appropriate it. We must apply the gift to our need that's accomplished by faith, for by grace are you saved through faith. What God requires of you is to believe. Now, we're living in an age and a day when that's becoming debatable. God loves you. He offers his son to save you. I do not believe that the scripture says it's automatic. You are responsible to believe. John chapter 3 says, if you do not believe, you're condemned already. If you do believe, you're not condemned. And the responsibility is on you as an individual. You have to believe. Now, even that comes from God, no doubt. Romans 12, 3, we are all given a measure of faith. It's given to every man. For those who believe that God only has so many folks he's going to save, you got some problems in the scripture. The book of Romans really does hang, up, hang you up. The book of John hangs you up. It's a great mental exercise, but you end up contradicting the scripture and ignoring parts of it. Yes, you are drawn by the Holy Spirit. Yes, you are chosen by God. you got to choose him too. My favorite illustration is when I, when I asked my wife to marry her. I chose to marry her. We didn't get married until she chose to marry me. Because if I had said, will you marry me? And she said, no, nah, I'll find somebody better. No, nah, I'm not ready. No, nah, you're not the one. I chose her, I took the lead, she said yes. Same is true in salvation. God loves you, he takes the lead, he offers you a gift, you have to accept it. Verse 8 and 4, we're going to close with this supplier. To Isaac, Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself for a burnt offering. And God did exactly what was predicted by Abraham. In a place which Abraham called Jehovah Jireh, the Lord supplies. The greatest need that anyone will ever have is salvation. And in salvation, it is the Lord that supplies. Where the needs are supplied, they're pretty simple. They're supplied in the place of obedience. Had Abraham decided to sacrifice, make an altar somewhere else other than where God said to go, there wouldn't have been the ram there. Mount Moriah was the place of obedience. Go to Mount Moriah and sacrifice your son in a place I will show you. The place of obedience is the place where supplies, needs are supplied. And the lesson is obvious. Acts of obedience are rewarded by God. He provides when we obey. God also supplies our needs after the faith of obedience. After the sacrifice of time and physical energy, emotional testing... Then the need presents itself and God supplies. God's timing is perfect. He supplies when there is a current need, not before, not after. His timing is just right on. And how will he supply? He'll do it himself. The variable is found in humanity in the faith and obedience of people. God is consistent. He's reliable. He's wise. He's totally trustworthy. God provided Israel with leaders that they needed, men like Moses and Joshua, David and Solomon. But there are times that God used things like ravens or an impoverished widow to meet the needs of his prophets. There were some wise men who showed up in Israel, in Jerusalem, and and asked where the king of the Jews was born. They were told Bethlehem. They went to Bethlehem and they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It was real soon after that Then an angel told Joseph, you take that mother and that boy and get them to Egypt. You know where they got the money to go to Egypt and live there until they were told to come back? God supplied the need through those wise men. He gave them the money for what they would need. Where was Joseph? Where was Mary? They were in the place of obedience, doing exactly what God had told them to do. God meets the needs of people. When it came time for 
the taxes to be paid for Jesus and the disciples. Peter asked the Lord about it. And the Lord says, well, go down there and fish. And a fish was caught with a coin in its mouth, the right, right amount of money to pay the taxes. God supplies needs when the needs are present in the place of obedience. Verse 12, the proof of the conduct. God used this event to teach Abraham how much he loved and trusted the Lord. When I was a kid, I lifted weights. I wrestled, swam. Part of the routine of those things was we lifted weights to try to get stronger. You don't know how much weight you can lift until you reach the place where you can no longer lift what you're trying. You really don't know what you're capable of until you push yourself. You will never know how strong your faith is or how great your faith is until your faith is put to the test. Does your behavior offer proof that you love the Lord? God look at you and say, ah, now I know. Does our behavior promise proof that we fear him? How about, does our behavior offer proof that we trust him? It's all important. God knows the extent of our love. He knows the extent of our spirit of sacrifice. He knows the strength of our spirit. We do not know. Our neighbors do not know. Sometimes God sends tests to us to prove our love for him, to prove our trust. These are lessons for us to learn because God already knows. God is teaching you about yourself through the tests, troubles, and trials that he sends in your life or that he allows to come in your life. It's not that he doesn't love you. He does love you. There are things that you need to learn, things that you need to em employ in your life, like faith. Abraham and Isaac not only went up the mountain together, they went down the mountain together. You ever wonder what they talked about on the way down? I don't think you have to wonder. Dad, wasn't that amazing? Dad, I can't believe you're going to do that. You tied me up. And Abraham said, well, son... I love you dearly, but I love the Lord even more than I love you. And he's teaching Isaac to be a man of God. Heavenly Father, help those of us who are fathers to teach our sons and our daughters to love you. Help us to teach it by how we behave, by how we act, by how we obey, by how we worship with them how we bring them along with us for every child in here. I pray that you teach us to obey our father, righteous father, the way Isaac would obey his dad. Isaac's not a little kid. He may be 17 or 18 years old when this takes place. And he humbles himself and is obedient to his father. We make a lot of the faith of Abraham. I think we can make just as much over the faith of Isaac. Isaac was willing to allow his father to take his life. He has faith in God too. Help us to have faith, to trust your word, in your will to be willing to sacrifice for you. Help us to not lose our common sense and our balance. Teach us from you this example of this great man of God, Abraham, and another great man of God, Isaac. Bless us now, we pray. Speak to our hearts. Help us to make decisions for you that need to be made. In Christ's name, amen.
Would you stand with us? It's our habit here to have a couple verses of invitation. On the first, we ask you to bow your head and close your eyes, and our music leader will sing for us. We will join him on the second verse. The words will be on the screen. While he sings this first verse, would you spend some time and pray? Robert? a special announcement. Go ahead and have a seat. Our drama lady, drama queen <laughs> is here. You have to sit down when Diane speaks or you can't see her. Go ahead, Diane. As you are frequently reminded by the pastor, <laughs> God made me short. <laughs> God also gave me tiny little bitty hands, very tiny. But in this hand today, I hold an entire evening of fabulous entertainment because this ticket is the ticket to the Ruskin Christian School Senior High Play, Anne of Green Gables. And today, for the amazing price of only $8, you can have an entire evening of entertainment. This price is only good today, folks. This is not one of those pitches you get on TV. This is a genuine opportunity for you to save money because this ticket is going to cost more on Thursday or Friday night. Right here in this auditorium, the play will take place and you'll have to pay more of your hard-earned money to get in to see this play. Now, it starts at 6.30 on either Thursday night or Friday night, and you can choose whichever night this ticket will get you into either night. Just don't miss the opportunity for this wonderful evening of entertainment for yourself or your family or your friends I hate to see you miss it, folks, and this is the last time this short little person is going to tell you about this wonderful evening of entertainment. The tickets are on sale right now. As soon as we say amen, back there in the back. Thank you, tall pastor. <laughs> when our oldest son was a little kid, we had a friend who was short. And she said, I'm, I'm just real short. And he said, no, Sharon, you're not short. You're fluffy. <laughs> the nickname for Diane is Sparkles. Because yes. that's what she does. She does sparkle up her room. So we've got a family coming to join today, Josh and Laura Irish. 
and their daughters, Ruby and Violet. You all want to come up here? They're joining from by the statement of faith, and then Ruby is going to be baptized on the 28th of this month. Amen. Do you all know which one's Ruby and which one's Violet? Ruby, Violet. All in favor of receiving the Irishes into the membership of First Baptist Church, would you say amen? amen. Any opposed? Good. Would you stand with me? Robert O. is going to come and dismiss us in prayer. And after he dismisses us in prayer, we're going to come up and welcome the Irishes into the fellowship of First Baptist. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your presence with us here today, for this great service that we've, we've, uh, we've had this morning. We pray uh, that the message that we have received will just... Uh, Find a dwelling place in our heart and draw us close to you as we reflect on it throughout the week. We thank you for the Irish family, for uh, the way they've already joined through their service and through their sacrifice, and now today just uh, officially becoming members of the church. May we continue to be a blessing to them and their family continue to be a blessing to this congregation. Uh, we pray for the uh, performance that's coming up this week. Just uh, allow the students to have clarity and remember all their lines and, and uh, just do the best that they can. and Take the talent that you have given them and just use it for your, your glory and give it back to you uh, with a great performance on Thursday and Friday night. Be with us all now as we go our separate ways and bring us back at the next appointed time. In Christ's name, amen. Mm -hmm.